I am John Hollenbeck. I am here from the University of Wisconsin Colleges Online, which is not the, the open teaching lab. But um, what we do, uh, well, I'll tell you about what we do, but I'm here to talk to you about a tool that we just started using, and that's SoftChat. So why don't we just get underway? I love the format of this thing. It makes me want to talk really fast, get out of your way, because I'd be interested to see what your experience is with this particular tool. But I will say one thing, and I hope this is the theme that comes through in this presentation. Too often, as instructional technologists slash instructional designers, we give you solutions and then look for a problem for them to solve. Our adoption of soft chalk was very much the opposite. We had major problem to deal with. We have a major problem to deal with. We are an online institution. We have all our classes have to be taught through media. And so we need to make it as good as we can and as engaging as we can. So we were looking for a solution to a problem. And I think that's a really important distinction, one that I, I think I want to honor. So yes, as, was, as John said, we're going to talk about what we wanted. And we're very much a collaborative group where I work. So I, I, tr I tried to weed out most of the items here. What was tried, what happened, what we'll do next. And we'll play with this thing. So let's. I'm going to start my magic presenter countdown because it'll start buzzing in my hand and tell me to shut up. So what I wanted, forgot to get it there. We needed a content object repository. I will explore what that is in a minute. But again, we are teaching a lot of classes. We have, well, I'll tell you what we have. But, so we needed a content object repository. And we did more active learning in our classes. Online learning, I, I was telling, telling John, um, when, I, I was a grad student here. I got my PhD here in the 90s. And I actually think I taught, or I was a graduate assistant on the first online course taught here. I had to set up the server and everything else. But it was, it was the adult independent learner with Cher Gibson, bless her heart. And I did my dissertation on it. But it's been going for a long time. And it's been a, a tension of tools versus wants as far as active learning versus presentation methods. So, we really want to get into more active learning. So I'm with the UW Colleges, which is in the system. We have 13 brick and mortar campuses across the state. That gives you an idea how spread out this is, because that is our faculty, that is the faculty that we work with. So my, uh, my trainings are a little different. We don't say, let's all get together for bagels. We say, let's fill out travel vouchers for bagels. <laughs> and, um, we are right here. I, I love that they g gave us a new graphic. We used to have the old graphic had online as a literally a biplane flying somewhere over Marshfield <laughs> with a banner behind it saying UWC online. So at least now we're a place. I was told later they said we didn't want to associate you with Madison because that makes everybody mad. So who knows? But anyway, we serve about 14,000 students. We're a transfer institution. Thousands of our students are. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. But our students are basically to get into your university. They are taking their first two years with us. If they graduate with an AA from UW colleges, they are guaranteed a seat in a UW somewhere. So that is our primary mission. We also do offer the AA degree. And there are people that stop out there. But typically, we transfer on. Online is about to become the 14th campus. We originally started off as a service for the campuses. Online literally began as the way to offer classes that were under enrolled on physical campuses. And we have slowly evolved into our own thing now. So we have 130 classes that are totally online being taught in a rotation. We have 2,000 students. And if one, thing, one thing I want to wear you out about, we have 10 different semesters that we deal with. We have three going on right now. So if I look a little hairy, that's why. So we are trying to configure our accelerated courses. We teach everything from three-week semesters to 15-week, 16-week semesters. And play them around and you know, our different clientele. We teach 500 of our students are from the UWs who want to pick up a class in winter or in the summer. And I understand you're all starting to think about that market for yourselves. So that's kind of our makeup. Our courses are developed by a lead instructor with an instructional designer. We have four instructional designers. Every course has a lead instructor that makes a master course. So we'll talk about that model next and how that looks. Um, and this gives you a sense of what our problem is. So we make a master course. We're teaching a 101 course. We get together. 
with the lead instructor and the instructional designer. We don't pay them a lot of money. And I will get that up front. This is not a like, wow, what an honor to be a lead instructor. No, you get a couple thousand dollars if you're lucky. But we get together, put the course together, make a master out of it. That course is then copied into sections every semester after semester. And I can hear my, my professors here saying, modernist education, lockstep, lockdown curriculum. And you would be right five years ago. Faculty now have the ability to modify their courses as they want. But so many of our faculty are IAS, they're just hired to teach that one class. We don't want to hand them a blank shell and say, here, make a course. We also, frankly, need to have quality control. We are a cost recovery unit. We need to make sure everything goes out looking at least at a baseline the right way. So we will help people customize courses, but a lot of people just don't, a lot of our faculty don't have time right now. For their tenure faculty on a four course load, and so forth, so on. So this kind of works. It looks, it looks scary. The biggest problem we have, and this is, gets to the content object repository, is we don't have a central location for our content. And that's what I wanted to solve, first of all. When I came here, I said, where's, where's the learning object repository? Because I worked, worked with Canvas, I can tell you stories. And I worked with Blackboard. And we had content repositories where you could put a piece of a document, and then it would be shared throughout your system. We didn't have that with the bright space that we bought, or it used to be called v So I was aghast, of course. Because the real advantage of it is, right now, if we make a document and put it in a course, and it's in every course, let's say that this instructor finds something wrong with it. We have to go into every course and fix it. And then we have to make sure to remember to go back to the master course, otherwise the mistake gets copied again. That's a problem. With an object repository, you link that document as an external link to all the, all the units, and therefore, all you have to do is fix that one. And so then you fix your course. You say, well, OK, big deal. It's a big deal. That's a lot of our time right now. So what we wanted was a solution that worked externally to the learning management system, because that's just what we needed to do. We wanted to be able to edit and revise once. And it would also be nice if we had reusable learning objects you can see that I've been in the business for a while. We used to talk about things like learning Scorum and all those things that never worked, but where we were trying to get shared learning objects that work together. We want things like that in our courses. We have common elements in all our courses. We'd love to be able to manage that. And we also had our problem that our courses were not so hot, to be honest. Um, originally in the online style manual, Faculty were told they had to write 80% of the content. What did that mean? E-lectures. And they all, all our pages ended up looking like this. And pages of this. I, my record in a class is there is one lesson that went on for 25 screenfuls of this. Went, well, I don't think so. They're probably not reading that, are they? So, you know, that, that's OK. We just know that's not the way we want to do it. So we wanted active content. We wanted interactive multimedia. And I love that term, and I don't care if it's out of fashion anymore. I love that term. I'm an old hypercard guy. But you know, I wanted, we wanted an embed valuation. I want, you know, when I teach, I'm looking at you. I'm getting evaluation to see if I'm dying or not up here, if you're getting it or not. And you want the, and then online, you don't have that. So something that is in, embedded in the page that says, OK, yeah, I think I understand this. Are you sure? OK, you are. Um, we want to support multiple modes of learning. And we want something to be used quickly by faculty. Because as you saw, our faculty is everywhere. And so we need a tool that's, you know, I, I love Adobe Captivate. I know Dan did a presentation on it. It's a fabulous tool. I don't, it, it's hard. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it, it, there's always that power versus ease of use that we deal with. That's why our iPhones are both maddening and magical. So we want our pages to look more like this. We want to have some formatting on them. We want to have interactive elements on them and so forth and so on. So what did we try to do? And I'm going to speed up here just to get us through here. Well, we tried with the kind of object repository to find a way around the limitations we had with Brightspace. And, one, and so we did a little hack here. 
we put in every one of our courses a resource center, and it contains student resources, and it contains um, uh, basic how-to-dos for bright space, because our students, again, are you know, typically remote, and so they need some help. This is in every course. We thought, well, this is a prime example of how to do a learning object. This is what a learning object repository should do. This is content that's the same in every course. We should put it in one place and edit. How do we do it? We want these pages to show up the same for everybody. Well, we discovered that in Brightspace, there's a little thing called the shared directory. This is not what it was meant to do. But we can put the resource center in here and share it out with all courses. I thought, good for us. We thought, this is really cool. Now, you'll notice that below it, and this I know it's real low, but there's something called archive. What we found out, don't you hear what it does there? I used to teach with HyperCard, and I would actually bug my stack so they would make noise like that if somebody got ahead of me. So what we discovered, though, was one day we went and, and so we got a, had an email, a help ticket saying, why does the welcome document in the Resource Center welcome me to the introduction to jazz? Like, I don't know. Why would it do that? Well, it turns out faculty can edit these documents because of their rights. And so that's really not what you want in the Learning Object Repository is we, our, our jazz professor, bless his heart, is 87 now. And he's in Russia on vacation teaching his jazz class. <laughs> guy's unbelievable. But he just saw, wow, great, a new thing for me to introduce and welcome people to my course. And so he changed it. I said, Bob, you changed that for the whole campus. He went, well, why did you let me do that? I said, well, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the limitation of that. The other thing that they, the faculty can do is they can erase the whole darn thing. And that's not good either. So, okay, that didn't work. Another thing we did with content and everything else, of course, is nagging. IDs are nagging constantly. I want more pictures. I want more videos. I want this. I want that. Well, that only goes so far as well. So none of this was particularly working. So what happened? Well, we had a wall to get over. And so I went to CIT and I, or, and I said, you know, buy, buy the Learning Object Repository. <laughs> no. All right, fine. Then I thought, okay, let's wonder. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Silly thing. Okay. La la la. Give away everything. So, use Google. Let's all use Google. I love Google. I think Google is like the, the bee's knees, collaborative documents, all that kind of stuff. Problem with Google. And our English department uses Google as an object repository. They, on their own, went out and made Google sites and put all their stuff in there. Well, that's great, but we can't be sure they're going to let us use Google in our system. We just, they, they don't, it's not supported, and it's not really enjoyed. So I thought, OK, what else we got? We got a SharePoint. <laughs> OK, that's funny. Uh, that's never going to work. Um, and so what did I do again? I asked for learning object repository, and I got yelled at. But okay, this is no good. Well, I was rooting around somebody who'd left in their files, and I noticed that they had a single license for soft chop. And I thought, oh, I remember. They were really interested in this, but they never went anywhere. So I started to investigate it. Basically, we, then I played around with free, free trial, as you will, made a course, put it in there. That led us to buy soft chop cloud, which is a place for us to put all of our courses. Let's try it out. We piloted courses this last semester. This is a new tool for us. It's a 12-year-old company, but it's a new tool for us. It worked. It freaking worked. There were no problems. The only problem that happened is when I messed around and tried to do something fancy. That was easily fixed. It worked. Yay. So we committed to it, bought the full package, which is the private cloud. And the private cloud gives us full administrator control over it and a lot of other nice things. So yay. It all worked <laughs> in the process. I hope. So what's next with this thing? Our road forward with SoftChuck is we're putting all of our new content for all our new course developments into it. We are on a cycle where we redesign courses about every four years maximum. Every new course design is to putting content in SoftChuck. So we have centralized content database. We're getting our lead instructors up and running on it, and that's going on right now. 
eventually we'll have accounts for all faculty. Because again, I said faculty should be able to put in supplemental material, their own version of material. We will give them the ability to do that. We can assign rights by course with this thing. We're developing a design language for it. You'll see that it's a constrained template driven piece of software and that's its strength and weakness. It has LTI integration with all learning management systems. So in other words, if you put an evaluation into a lesson, that will go into grades. That will create a grades, um, a grades slot. And that is very nice. Little, it's a little, well, no, it works fine. And we're eventually going to get them back to our creating course objects. All of our stuff, our resource center like stuff, is now in SoftTalk and is going there. So that is kind of, that's, that's where we're going with it. So we're at the point now where we've piloted it, it works, we've committed, and we're uh, in two weeks, I'm having faculty in, and we're going to have a full uh, training session on using this thing. And eventually what I want to do with it, and this is something I saw at a DT now I think a couple of years ago, is I want students to use it. I want students to have this as a resource to do rich media. Okay, so that's, a, that's the basic idea. We're going to play with it. My last thought about this is that what, you, what we've always wanted in education is a combination of power and ease of use. And I, I referenced HyperCard. That was HyperCard's genius. It was, this is pre-web and pre-everything else. It was easy to use. It did lead to a lot of bad software. <laughs> yeah. It, I always said it made the easy part easier. And that's true with all these things. But it was an entry point. And with the web, we lost those kinds of tools. This is kind of a step back. So I advise you to pull out your device. I wonder how it's going to, I think, it, yeah, I like the word spline on the surface. And go to softtrack.com, let me go to softtrack.com. 